What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the channel as we continue our 31 days of Halloween. And today, we're going to continue talking about the Halloween franchise. In particular, Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Now, Resurrection and H2O are on this triple feature. And we'll be talking about those at a later date, not today. Today, it's all about The Curse of Michael Myers. Why? Because not only do we have the theatrical cut, but we also have the unrated producer's cut. And there are significant changes throughout the film. Now, basically... In this film, it picks up after the events of Halloween 5. Jamie Lloyd's character is in this film, but not a lot. She is replaced. Daniel Harris is replaced in this film. But basically what we're going to get to, because this introduces the idea of the cult of Thorn. Under, you know, basically introducing the idea that there is this cult that is controlling Michael, making him do the things that he does. You know, he's been under, the, under, under the control of the cult. For quite some time. And this is all taking place at Smith's Grove. But what we're going to do is, is really talking about too much about the story. We're going to talk about the significant changes in the film. Because basically the story is, it's a Halloween film. It is. And it does feel like a Halloween film in certain aspects of this. It's not the best Halloween film. But I do like some of the things that they do do in this film. Now we do have Paul Rudd. His theatrical debut is in this film as, you know, an older Tommy Doyle, who obviously is very traumatized still from the events of 78 as a child. As you can see, he's definitely, there's definitely something, you know, something a little bit off about Tommy Doyle in this one. But Paul Rudd, again, he's Paul Rudd, and he does a good job. For his first debut, for his debut film, he does a pretty good job. Dr. Loomis, Donald Pleasance, is back in this film. His last theatrical film that he um was in before he passed away. Actually, he had passed away when they were doing reshoots for this film as well. So, you know, they had to go and maneuver some things around here and there to be able to finish the film, even though he has passed away. Now, basically this, you know, Jamie Lloyd, she's she's older. She, is, she has had a baby. She's, you know, given birth, but she's on the run. This cult wants to sacrifice her baby. She, you know, the baby is like a descendant of, of he's, he's a relative. He's, he's a Myers. He's, a, you know, He's, you know, a relative of Michael Myers. And, you know, she is able to get away with the help of somebody, you know, a nurse who's a, basically, basically a member of the cult, you know, has a change of heart and helps her escape. And unfortunately, you know, Jamie, she's able to get her baby to safety, but Michael does catch up to her and she is impaled on this large farm equipment. But her death is different in the producer's cut. Now, the, the duration of the films are only about a six or seven minute difference between the actual theatrical and the producer. But the producer's cut actually shows more of, you know, this idea of this cult of thorn uh, that is controlling Michael. Like I said, Dr. Loomis is brought back in, you know, back into this as well. And, you know, it's actually, things are explained a little bit more in the producer's cut. Like Dr. Loomis, obviously, in the fire from Halloween 2, you know, he had the scar on his face. And... It, in the theatrical, it does not explain why the scar is gone. But in this, he does explain that, you know, he had some plastic surgery, you know, kind of just to get over things. So people wouldn't be scared of him seeing, you know, his face and stuff, you know, with the scar. So that's taken away and not explained in the theatrical cut. But the producer's cut also explains, you know, Jamie Lloyd, she survives longer. Her death is different in the producer's cut. In the producer's cut, she survives. She's just, she's stabbed with a knife by Michael and left for dead. But Dr. Loomis and a colleague of his, who will come into play later on, as we find out this colleague is the man in black. The man in black is finally, you know, we discover who, who you know, who's this character that came into play back in Halloween 5 that broke Michael out of jail at the end of the film. But Dr. Loomis, you know, and his, and his uh, colleague see that, you know, find, you know, Jamie is still alive. You know, she's on her way. The paramedics are taking her to the hospital. And this is where Jamie, even though she survived a little bit longer into the film, this is where she meets her demise in the hospital because the man in black shoots her in the head as she lays, you know, basically recovering in her hospital bed. And, you know, that is the end of Jamie Lloyd. But, like I said, her, her before that, she was able, at the beginning of the film, make it to a bus stop and, you know, get a message out over the radio through this, you know, this, um, this disc, disc jockey who was talking, you know, in, you're interviewing people about Michael Myers you know, she gets a message out, you know, Dr. Loomis, if you can hear me, I need your help. And she leaves the baby at the bus, you know, at the bus depot. And Tommy Doyle is able to track down where the baby is, you know, where the message, you know, well, not really so much track down where the baby is because he doesn't know, they don't know about the baby. 
but he make it to the you know to, makes it to the bus depot where you know Jamie made the phone call from, and he's able to track down there. This is the weird part because these people at this bus depot do not clean up the bloods at all from where Jamie was because you can see that he just follows a trail all the way down to the bathroom where she was at and is able to find the baby and takes the baby to safety. And this is where again where it's different because Dr. Loomis, you know, Tommy brings the baby to the hospital, but Dr. Loomis is already there. But it's not explained why Loomis is why he's at the hospital. But in the producer's cut, it is explained. You know, he's there because they followed Jamie to the hospital to make sure she was okay. But in the theatrical, he just he's just there. You know, and Tommy, you know, sees him and says, you know what, meet me later on. Because now there's going to be a Halloween festival. They're going to finally celebrate Halloween again. And, you know, because they have not celebrated in Haddonfield in a while. But this all comes back to, you know, like I said, Tommy Doyle. He's keeping an eye. He has a telescope. He's keeping an eye across, at the house across the street, which is the Strode house, Lori Strode's house. Which now another, you know... Descendants, relatives of the Strode family are living there in that house. And Michael is coming for vengeance. And, you know, he gets there. And before I go on and more, the mask is a little bit better on Michael than it was in Halloween 4 and 5. But still not the greatest. And throughout the, between the theatrical and the producer's cut, because there were reshoots that were done, there's a different Michael playing the role. So you have a little bit more bulkier, heavier set Michael in some shots. And you have a slimmer michael and others so it it you definitely could tell where the reshoots were done in this film so it's that's another interesting thing you know that they had to do to try to get this film get this film done this film does it, it's sporadic in certain ways and it sometimes it flows sometimes it doesn't but it does get the aesthetic of halloween you know pretty well and i and that i do applaud it for that um but the family, the Strode family is living there. You have a mother, you have a father, you have an older daughter who's in college. Her son, she has a son. And, the you know, her father is obviously not happy that she had had a son. Because um, now, you know, she he's not, he doesn't want anything to do with his daughter. She's back living there, but she doesn't, he does not want anything to do with his daughter. And, but the father, the father, he's a jerk. i put it flat out, he is a jerk. And he does meet his demise very brutally in the, um, theatrical cut. They did change that up and made his death way more gruesome in the, the uh, theatrical cut than it is in the producer's cut. He's electrified. But in the producer's cut, he just, you know, he's electrified and he dies. In the theatrical cut, he, like, his head explodes. <laughs> and it is like a pumpkin exploding. Pun, you know, pun, no pun intended, a pumpkin exploding. His head, boom, he just, it pops. And, you know, the mothers take a rip. There are a lot of scenes that Definitely, there's a little bit of callback here and there to certain things. I actually made some notes because I figured, you know what? There are some significant differences in this film. The Cult of Thorn is explored way more in the, in the producer's cut than it is in the theatrical cut. You know, like even the ending. The ending is completely different between the two different cuts of the film. We have voiceover at the beginning of the voiceover that, that talks about Michael at the beginning of the films is different. Loomis does the voiceover during the producer's cut. The producer's cut also has more of that traditional Halloween imagery with the, you know, with the logo and, you know, and pumpkins on the screen and the, and the sound. It's a more traditional John Carpenter music in that film. Now, let me see what exactly. Yeah, I think I pretty much covered everything that is different, except except when we get to the end, because the end, like I said, this is why I had to make some notes because the ending, you have everything goes back to Smith's Grove. It comes back to Smith's Grove, and like I said, Loomis's colleague, he is you know unveiled to be the leader of this cult. He's the man in black, and you know he has taken this this girl this this. Um, older college girl, you know, from the Strode family, and her son, her son, he's definitely, he can be controlled, he, they definitely, there's something there where he can maybe be manipulated to, you know, be another Michael Myers, he's, he's kind of like under control, you know, a voice telling him, you know, kill, you want to kill this person, you want to kill that person, but in the theatrical cut, they take the mother, and the mother is basically, she's in this cell at Smith's Grove, Tommy, you know, Tommy shows up, Michael's, you know, in pursuit, but Tommy shows up and breaks her free, and, you know, between the two of them, they're able to, you know, kind of, you know, slow Michael down and, you know, get the baby, you know, rescue the baby because the baby has been taken by the cult. And, you know, she rescues her son. And, you know, Loomis joins in as well. And, 
Yotami, he takes like this corrosive, like these needles and basically stabs Michael and is able to stop Michael basically right, you know, in his track. Michael's, he's not dead, but you know, but he's, you know, he's there and, you know, but he's basically, he stopped right the, you know, for them for the time being. But the end of the film with the uh, theatrical cut is Dr. Loomis is there, you know, Tommy and this girl, you know, she, um, her name is Kara. They take off, you know, with the baby and, and her son, you know, to, you know, to safety. Loomis stays back and he's like, you know, I have some things I got to take care of because his colleague, you know, is still alive and, you know, Smith's Grove. And that's basically, this is going to continue again, but it never did pick up. They want it rebooting basically back to H2O instead. But you just hear Loomis yell like, inside Smith's Grove. And you don't know exactly what happened to him. You know, did Michael come back? Did Michael get him? Did he die? You know, you don't know exactly, you know, what what transpired. In the producer's cut, it's it's completely different. Because this girl, Kara, who was taken, you know, she's like basically on this slab, this metal, this uh, stone slab. And she's about to be sacrificed. They want her son, to, you know, to do the sacrifice, basically, of, of killing her. And the baby's there. And Michael's there. And the cult is just surrounding them. Again, producer's cut. Tommy's able to, you know, he knocks out a member of the cult, steals like their 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 robe. He's able to get in there and save her and get, you know, get her and the baby and the son to safety. You know, Dr. Loomis, he, you know, but Tommy, getting back, you know, Dr. Loomis, he's there as well. But you can see the different cuts where you know, when after, you know, Donald Pleasance has passed away, where they have to like do like voiceovers and you know, you don't really see Loomis like in, you know, in front of the camera. But he's there to help them, you know, try to get away. Tommy, though, before they're able to get to safety, he has this idea that he runs by Loomis early on or, or before they get to, like I said, there's a lot. There's a lot of changes in this film. You know, try to go back and forth between the two different cuts. But Tommy has this idea, once they get to Smith's Grove with Loomis, that, you know, he takes these stones, these ruins, basically, that if he spreads them out and he puts and he cuts himself and puts blood on the ground, that's like a source of like light can stop the darkness of Michael. And Tommy's right because it actually it basically paralyzes Michael to where Michael cannot move. And that's kind of like how they leave. You know, Michael just basically like kind of like dies. Like he's just he's on the ground. You don't know if he's dead or alive, but he's just that's it. So again, from there we take off and we see once again Tommy, Kara, and Kara and her son and the baby off the safety. Loomis, though, now we do go back in the Smith's Grove and you see Loomis is standing over Michael. He's like, oh, you know, Michael, you know, he's, you know, you can see that there's a little bit of remorse there. And he pulls the mask off and it's his colleague. His colleague's not dead, but he, but Michael has knocked him out. And he, now there's this marking that is on, um, on the wrist of, of, um, Dr. Loomis's colleague, the man in black. And, he has basically taken this marking, the, the mark of Thorn, and he's passed it by grabbing hold of Loomis's wrist. He has passed that evil mark over to Loomis. Now, again, we don't know where, where you know, what was going to uh, um, transpire from that, because again, with Donald, uh, Donald Pleasant's passing away, and this film not being received very well, and them just rebooting the H2O. We don't know what they were going to do with that. But we do see Loomis is yelling, like, no, I can't believe, you know. And obviously, Michael has taken the man in black attire, and now he has taken off. And that's basically how you just see Michael going through the um, the corridors of Smith's Grove, and he is making his way out to safety. And now somebody else to try to find Michael, which we'll never know because they do not expand any. Like I said, that's it. That's basically how this timeline for Halloween ends before we jump over to H2O. So it's interesting. I know, you know, I might have bounced back and forth between the two, you know, two different films. But it's, I was not sure there was going to be that much of a difference. But wow, I mean, when you watch both films, they, there is a difference. There absolutely is a difference. And the producer's cut, if you haven't seen it, it's only like five or six bucks. It's a cheap pickup. And it's definitely worth picking up if you're a Halloween fan. If you just want to see significant differences, I mean... I was telling my cousin about this the other day, and he was like, oh, so basically it's like the Snyder Cut, but for Halloween. Like, yeah, essentially it's like the Zack Snyder's Halloween Cut. So, <laughs> and it's it, but it is, and there is a significant difference in how this film ends. And, yeah, I can't, I, you know, it's, I was really surprised. I didn't think, of, I didn't think it was going to be that much of a difference, but there was. There absolutely was. So that is The Curse of Michael Myers, both the, the actual cut and the producer's cut. So... 
If you see both these around, pick them up and, you know, do a comparison for yourself. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. It's, like I said, it's, it's not the greatest Halloween film, but it's definitely worth exploring if you want to see just an alternate, you know, alternate timeline, basically, or alternate version of these, you know, of these different films. But like I said, we will get back to the triple feature at a later date, obviously, before Halloween takes place. But... I want to get back to H2O. That'll be the next one that I'm going to do. And then Resurrection. Is Resurrection as bad as what people say it is? Well, it's been a while since I've seen it. So I definitely want to go and see. And, you know, maybe, you know, see how my, my opinion is. It's not a bad film. It's not a great film. But it's fun. And I think that's the most important thing. But will my opinion change? Check me out after. It's been a few years since I've seen it. So like, subscribe, and comment if you get the chance. And I'll catch you in another episode.